And good afternoon, Yusuf Enriquez, founder and CEO of Indigenous Health. Michael Akinyale, founder and president of Indigenous Health. So yeah, originally, originally born in, in Kingston, Jamaica, grew up in the islands, uh, went to high school there, and uh, came to the U.S. in the early 90s, uh, where I went to high school in Miami, grew up in, you know, inner city, uh, underserved populations, and uh, uh, played soccer, so, you know, soccer came, kept me out of, out of trouble while I went to high school, and I uh, always had a, uh, a passion to serve military, and so when I got out high school, uh, joined the military, uh, but I also loved health care. So growing up, I used to, you know, watch Doogie Howser growing up as a kid, you know, only having one channel in the islands. And so I've always had a passion of, you know, solving health care issues. Um, and so it was only right that I joined the military being a, a, a combat medic where I spent about a good six, seven years working in some of the, the large medical hospitals that's attached with the U.S. Army Medical uh, Command. Uh, due to injuries, my military career got cut short, and so I ended up uh, here in Washington, D.C., where I um, attended Howard University as I started to uh, transition back into the civilian uh, health care system, getting out of the military and, and moving into the VA health care system. Um, and so, you know, uh, throughout that, I've uh, raised you know, four daughters, uh, father of four. So I, I was born in Ibado, Nigeria. Uh, that's where I grew up. And I was fortunate to be born into the upper middle class uh, where my Father's uncle was actually the first person to get a college degree in our family. He got his college degree in 1912. And because of that history and the history with our family leading uh, the church in Ibano, uh, you know, our Christian faith and our education was, was foundational uh, to who we were and what we did. Um, I had the opportunity from there uh, to move to the United States uh, in 2002, and that's where I attended Howard as well. Uh, strangely enough that I went to Howard uh, 2002, mm -hmm. which is also when Yusuf uh, got into Howard. And obviously didn't make the connection there, but <laughs> I, we're making the connection now. And at Howard, I studied economics and got my first exposure to the American healthcare system, managing clinics, uh, pediatric outpatient clinics uh, here in the DC area. So I did that from my sophomore year to my senior year. I really got an exposure to some of the challenges people of color, like our communities face, uh, accessing healthcare, and really just how some healthcare systems treat us differently. And so from then on, I, I made a commitment to myself uh, to try and make a difference. After graduating from Howard University, spent a bit of time in management consulting, advising different types of healthcare organizations. I uh, ended up getting my MBA from Stanford University and from there on, I just really focused on, on working on the American healthcare system. When my father passed in 2014, at that moment, I decided to take all of the knowledge that I have around how healthcare works and start looking for opportunities to make it better, uh, to create opportunities for our communities to get the best access to care, to get personalized access to care, because ultimately I recognized that a lot of the treatments a lot of the care paths that were available were not designed with us in mind. They were not designed to optimize our health and well-being. And so my commitment since 2014 has been about looking for avenues to do that. From management consulting, I looked into impact investing. I ultimately realized that wasn't gonna get me where I wanted to go. From impact investing, I, I was the chief innovation officer at the US Department of Veterans Affairs. And at the VA, I thought, Here's an opportunity to lead innovation at this large agency with a significant budget. And while the mission was great and the budget is significant, there was still something missing. And ultimately, after transitioning from my work at the VA, and, and that happened last year, I've been looking for that right opportunity. And I believe that opportunity is here at Indigenous Health, where along with um, 
you know, Yusuf and the rest of our co-founders, we're looking to build and lead um, in this area around advancing health equity, around building a healthcare ecosystem that's designed with people of color in mind. Um, our mission is to build the most valuable and genetically diverse data bank on the planet. Our purpose, the reason why we're doing this, is so that we can partner with vulnerable communities that have been left behind to maximize the value of their genetic data for their benefit and for the benefit of the global population. And for that reason, we're focused on black, indigenous, people of color, and the veteran community. Our passion, because of where we're from as immigrants, is to ultimately help connect all people who are of African descent, who are fundamentally have been displaced because of European colonialism and because of the transatlantic slave trade, back to their ancestral roots. The reason this is important is not just because of the impacts of climate change that we're seeing in the Caribbean, where Yusuf is from, but ultimately because there is a lingering race-based traumatic stress associated with not knowing where you're fundamentally from. Um, I suffer from some of that because of knowing that Nigeria was created by the British in 1914 to serve their specific purpose. The history of Nigeria is only from 1914. But the history of where my people are actually from is the Yoruba Kingdom, and that predates all of what we've seen, it goes back into the early 1100s. And that was the history I was robbed of because when the British came, they split up the Yoruba Kingdom and put parts of it in Nigeria, parts of it in the Benin Republic, and parts of it in Togo. And so for me, I need to understand a lot. And that's me coming from Africa, um, from originally you. still having this gap. Um, and so when you layer that on with a lot of the microaggressions and outward racism we experience um, living in pretty much a European dominated world. Mm -hmm. um, it is very challenging. Um, and then when we look at what's going on in places like Africa as it relates to COVID, where there's only 4% of the population in Africa that's been vaccinated, and you have this ongoing narrative about how things can't work, well, Africa was basically designed by the European colonials, and they didn't design it so that Africa would be successful. They designed it so that Africa would be performing and functioning the way it's functioning right now. And so we have to fundamentally understand how we can connect people back and give people a path to building a better future. Because the path we're on right now is not a good one. Um, and I say that for people in Africa, people in the African diaspora, we're not on a good path. And, and we have to lead the charge. No one is coming to save us. We have to do this ourselves. Yeah, and I think, you know, just to echo what a lot of Michael said, um, the Caribbean was the same way. And growing up in the islands, you know, under the British system as well, and I came here at a young age. So my family went through the inner cities and the, you know, the underserved areas as far as getting access to health care in Miami. Um, and so the first time I had real um, you know, uh, standard health care is when I joined the military at 17. So prior to that, it was clinics here, you know, urgent clinic there. And so you know, I've been able to see the, the health disparities that you know, um, plague our inner city communities when we don't have that access to health care. I think it even got more prevalent to me on how, um, why the health disparity gap um, was when I started working for the FDA straight out of Howard, when I got out of Howard. So straight out of Howard, I started working for a pharmaceutical company doing uh, market access. And then in 2006, I was hired at the FDA to do medical advice approvals. Um, and it, it was really disappointing to see you know, the lack of diversity that was just in the room that I was in and also the, you know, the lack of diversity in the individuals that were in these clinical trials, both on the drug side and the device side. 
And so I had a, a first-hand knowledge of that. I knew that 95% of the drug trial were European white males that entire time. And it, it also frustrated me um, to see that very little that was done on the policy side. Um, but I carried that with me for over, what, 15 years now. And I think, to your point, you know, I think when COVID happened, that really brought up all of that historical knowledge that I had, you know, garnered over those years of knowing that this was a fundamental and structural um, yeah. problem that carried across multiple systems um, in the healthcare pathway. And so um, that's the why where Indigenous Health made sense for me to, to, to work with um, Michael on, on creating that, um, that new era and ecosystem that would encompass all individuals, including uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So yeah, when COVID occurred, you know, I, that's what really heightened, you know, my sensitivity around, you know, this is stuff that I already know from, from working at FDA. Um, you know, to your point, you know, being a medic, you know, being in the healthcare field, you know, I think, you know, kudos to a lot of the healthcare professionals that stood in that crisis. Um, and so myself, you know, being that I'm, a, you know, a recovering medic, <laughs> um, you know, the same thing was, was on my path. I started saying, well, what can I do? Uh, how can I try to help? Um, you know, again, we're all isolated in our homes. But I'm, I'm like, all right, I need to get out there and figure something out. So, you know, I had volunteered to be, you know, uh, I couldn't use any license because I didn't have a license at the time. But, you know, there was efforts to volunteer to be, you know, go up to New York and help, you know. So they had a network of medics that were putting together uh, plans to take buses up there to help out. Um, but something fundamentally, you know, really started happening. It was like, well, we need to do something a little bit better than that where I think it's time for us to address that elephant in the room, which is the fact that, you know, there's been this health disparity that's just amongst um, our people and people of color. And we're starting to see it play out, right? We got bodies there in, in New York, um, black and indigenous folks that you know, weren't in good health in the first place. Yeah. And now this COVID is ripping through the entire country and the globe. Um, and so, yeah, I got a call from MIT that said, hey, uh, we're trying to hack racism in healthcare. And I thought that was quite interesting um, <laughs> to give me the platform to do that because I was already like, somebody needs to do something and get out here. Um, and so, yeah, it ended up being that I said, okay, are you sure you want me to do this? And they're like, yeah, you know, we're looking for somebody to champion this and we think your background and what you've been doing. And so, yeah, we were able to put together a discussion panel late September and was able to drive, you know, a lot of audience, you know, interest from, you know, April Ryan, Maya Rockamore, the late Elijah Cummings' wife, um, including lack of diversity in healthcare. And that became even more prevalent as I started to do the research and get more knowledge around the diversity and lack of diversity in clinical trials, the health disparities popped up. And then I'm looking at, well, what's going on with Africa? Well, it's the same, similar health disparities and disease areas that are focused um, there in Africa. And then so indigenous really came to my mind of, you know, focusing on not just African-Americans um, here in the U.S. and the folks that are here in the U.S., but I had to expand it. It was only right to start thinking about expanding this sort of global initiative. Yeah. And that's what indigenous health is. These are underserved communities. That's the fundamental reason. Uh, it is also the communities that we are from. Uh, so ultimately, for us, we are trying to build a business, and we are building a business that's going to have an impact. Um, and so when we think about the, the global population, 22% uh, of the global population is of African ancestry, and about 60 some odd percent is of other ancestry and so between other ancestry and african ancestry majority of this world's population is people of color and so when we think about building a business 
uh, that's fundamentally about solving some hard problems and discovering novel therapies. Building it for the majority of the world's population is the common sense thing to do. It's the profitable thing to do. And it's the most impactful thing to do. And so our focus is to help improve the health and well-being of communities of color, uh, which cover all colors. Um, and when we think about veterans, I have a soft spot for veterans. So I myself am not a veteran, uh, but I have the opportunity to serve as the Chief Innovation Officer for the Department of Veterans Affairs. And some of what I noticed while I was working there was that ultimately only about 33% of our nation's heroes are in contact with or actively engaging the Department of Veterans Affairs. So the majority of our nation's heroes are not connected to the entity that was stood up by the U.S. government to help them. And so for us, with Indigenous Health, our goal, our hope, our vision is that we are able to create a platform that's able to serve all 19 million veterans in the United States and beyond just our veterans here in the United States. What's common with veterans who've been in combat is the trauma they were exposed to as a result of that combat. And so what we're hoping to do is not just address some of the emotional, mental well-being challenges that people who are veterans have faced with combat exposure, but to actually look at populations of people across the world that have been exposed to combat-related trauma. Because if we can solve it for our nation's heroes, we can ultimately solve it for every community around the world who's struggling with PTSD, suicidal ideation, and a host of other issues as a result of their exposure uh, to combat trauma. And so that's why we're focused on communities of color and, and veteran populations. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, it's, it's where we're from, right? As, as Michael mentioned, um, you know, I have a deep passion for veterans because I'm a veteran. Um, I've served with a lot of veterans and I've lost a lot of veterans. And so you know, the biggest um, passion for me right now around my veterans is the sacrifice they've made and then to come back home and still are struggling with getting the right health care and you know, the proper care. And so, you know, as Michael uh, mentioned, I spent some time working for the VA in the clinical room and then I uh, worked with a lot of the um, uh, VSOs, Veteran Service Organization, in pushing policies that advocated for veterans throughout my career. I think the biggest impact for me is, is to make sure, one of the reasons why I chose working for the FDA was making sure that even though I didn't have the uniform, I was protecting the veterans and the minority communities um, and being that one voice um, that was in the room when decisions were being made on medical advice and drugs. Um, so part of my work at the FDA was making sure that drugs were safe and effective for our minority communities because we already knew that there are certain areas, disease areas that affected minority populations and you would see significant adverse events in those areas. And so one of my key jobs while I worked at the FDA was post-market surveillance and pharmacovigilance. So it was part of my job to make sure that you know the adverse events that were being reported were reported one significantly as serious and then making determination on if those medications should be withdrawn and devices should be drawn from the market. Um, one thing that definitely um, had me feeling good about me working at the FDA was that when I would see a large portion of that going to our veteran health care system. So I felt like even though I didn't have the uniform on, I was still doing my part to make sure that the veterans are getting, one, the best innovative technology getting approved through the FDA from the device side. And that's also making sure that the medication would be um, effective. And so if there is any, you know, adulteration or misbranding of those products, I felt like, you know, without being in service, I still was protecting the consumer and the, and the public, which were my veterans entail. Um, just as a community, again, as I said, um, you know, being here as a, a, you know, coming from another country, um, there's a land of opportunity, but also in the communities that I've grown up in, I've seen what the health disparities focus on. And at 43 now, you know, I'm in a lot better, healthier shape than a lot of my counterparts that I went to high school with.
from a Caribbean community I grew up. And there's a big difference, you know, and again, you see it. So, you know, this is not something that's hidden in the closet. You can definitely see um, the difference in health care when you have, you know, um, a good job, good benefits and good health care benefits as opposed to you working on, you know, uh, going to these clinics and, and some of the, uh, the, um, the health care system that's provided to the under, underserved and the inner city community. Yeah, so you know, my, my passion around um, really diving into uh, veteran and veterans health care really stemmed from what Michael previously mentioned was the PTSD and suicidal ideation. Um, September 2012, I lost a Marine to suicide. And this Marine was a little bit special because he was my kids aftercare provider. So, you know, other than being in school and, or being home, they spent a lot of time with Mike was his name in RT summer camp here in the DC area. And then the aftercare program where they stayed after school and you know, until the parents picked them up. Uh, Mike, 200 pounds, solid, um, young guy, served two tours in Iraq. Um, and one day decided not to come home, come to work, um, took his life at home. Um, and so that woke me up to kind of bring what I, you know, knowing what was going on, but to my doorstep of having um, Mike take his life and given the fact that I had three daughters at that time attending that elementary school. So you can see how catastrophic, and most parents there were all government employees, so they had two to three kids there as well, um, over 30 kids. Um, that sent me on a path uh, to really start focusing on the veteran community because I realized that it was 22 suicides a day, almost one an hour. Her day. Uh, that was something I didn't know until Mike passed away and so went on this, uh, this mission to really dive into um, what the current standard of, of, of PTSD assessment and behavioral health in our military community looked like and how could I improve that. And one of the things I came out with other than just having the standard of care which is uh, surveys was that this had to be had some genetic component because I've seen what trauma from a combat standpoint, had done to, I mean, physically fit soldiers and the deterioration after they've been affected by uh, combat trauma. Um, and so I spent about the next 60 to 90 days just reading journal articles and citing reference uh, genes that were associated with PTSD and ended up with over uh, an 800 gene um, uh, notebook that I had written down specific to mental health and PTSD specifically and stumbled on you know unique aspect of how your body reacts to trauma and which one of the genes those affected and uh, hence that became uh, a project that turned into reality because call it divine intervention that January after my passed away in 2012, 2013, I got a call from Rachel Yehudu, who's one of the world renowned traumatic stress researchers in Mount Sinai, that I had applied for a job and I was, I, I pretty much got the job to oversee her portfolio of PTSD in MTBI, which is Mount Traumatic Brain Injury Research in a leading institution like Mount Sinai. And I immediately I thought this was a joke because I had just literally spent uh, in 90 days handwriting genes that I thought may be directly correlated with PTSD and here I was called yeah. called to action to then uh, come up to New York and oversee over 25 million dollars worth of PTSD and MTBI research which Rachel was in charge of at the Bronx VA um, in, in the Bronx and so uh, it wasn't even a question I told her I'd be there and got there February of 2013 and we were able to start working on looking at some of these genes that we had identified. Um, fast forward in 2016, we were able to convince the patent office around three genes with strong predictive value around predisposition to PTSD. And uh, I immediately, when the patent got approved in January 26, 2016, I'll never forget the day, um, I went into my boss office after she sent me the patent approval and I told her I resigned. <laughs> And she said, no, you can't resign. And I said, and I told her the story about Mike. 
and uh, she said, I always wondered why you would leave D.C. to come up here to the Bronx. Yeah. Um, and she said that finally made sense to her because she always was puzzled why I left yeah. the, 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 the D.C. area to come up there. Um, and so, yeah, uh, that set me on a path of a new frontier of uh, entrepreneurship. Never done a business before. And so I ended up uh, starting um, to work with Mount Sinai. Uh, with the patent that they had given, which was uh, predominantly used uh, with Holocaust survivor, World Trade Center survivors that were used to identify um, those particular genes, and uh, started to get the exclusive rights to the patent. And so uh, my first company I started was directly focused on PTSD biomarkers, which was the patent from Mount Sinai, which was Polaris Genomics. And so Polaris Genomics really um, took a lot of my energy over the last um, three to four years since 96, now, 2016, 2017, when I started to create an uh, entity and went out to the Illumina Accelerator in San Francisco and actually built a blood test, which I thought wasn't even conceivable <laughs> when I started on this journey in 2012, that this was actually something that could be done. And so, you know, that just shows the, 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 the passion and the drive I had to try to help bring something to the table that would benefit our veterans. And so currently it's at the VA, uh, still undergoing some validation study, but, you know, it's, it's been my best work since I've been in the entrepreneur space and I'm looking to expand that now, working with Indigenous Health because we now see that this is a bigger and global issue, not just... Um, with veterans, uh, traumatic stress and trauma that has been afflicted upon us, you know, in multiple areas, um, has now become a big issue across the globe. And so I'm hoping that Polaris work that I did is the groundwork for what Indigenous Health would expand on and take this across the globe. We are leading a movement and we want people to join us in this movement for several reasons. One of those reasons is we recognize the value of genetic data. Genetic data that's contained within each and every one of us. What we also recognize is that the genetic data of communities of color are significantly underrepresented in the data bank that's used to discover new drugs and to discover new therapeutics. And so the first reason is if people join this movement, we will want them to come to us knowing that we are a trusted data steward who will take their data, their privacy seriously. And we will build an ecosystem that's focused on discovering therapeutics to serve and meet the needs of our community. I lost two friends earlier this year to sickle cell disease. Uh, they were both in their prime, they both left their families devastated. When I looked into how much the National Institutes of Health spent on sickle cell research in 2020, the numbers were very, very low. And they were not just low in absolute terms, they were low when compared to other things. They spent, this institution spent our taxpayer dollars twice as much on dietary supplement research, four times as much on physical activity research, and 30 times as much on aging research when sickle cell disease and the trait is in 300 million people of color on this earth, when sickle cell disease is the number one inherited blood disorder in America. When sickle cell disease affects one out of every 500 African Americans, when sickle cell disease affects one out of every 1,400 Hispanic Americans. So the one first reason is that we are determined to build a data ecosystem that will understand the issues that primarily affect people of color and come up with innovation to put drugs and new therapies on the market the other reason people should join the movement is that we're building a business enterprise 
that will reward those who partner with us at the individual level, at the community level, and at the global level. And we're not doing it with handouts. We're not doing it with chump change. We're doing it with the equity of this company, which we're setting 5% of the equity of this company aside to the benefit of our members, who are those who join us, and their communities. Beyond that, we're also setting aside 10% of our net profits, also to go into reinvesting into our members and their communities. You know, Johnson & Johnson is worth half a trillion dollars. I have no idea how much of that half a trillion in value they've shared with the millions of lives uh, that have been part of all of their research into all the drugs they've brought to market. We're going to be different. Our goal with anyone who joins this movement is that there are partners with us along the way. Full transparency, our members will have a seat at the table. We will build this together and we will chart a new path around drug discovery. We will chart a new path around rewarding our PAC partners. And we are happy for the rest of the industry to emulate our leadership in this area uh, because we would love for every single person who is working on developing new therapies, who is working on genetic data to reward the people uh, that they're getting all this information from in a meaningful way. We're gonna take the lead because that's who we are um, and we're happy to have the entire industry follow our lead. No, absolutely. I think uh, the time is now, and I think we've echoed that through this uh, interview, is that um, we've seen the devastation in our communities, and I think the time is now for us to act. I think the opportunity for us now is to act. Um, and where I see um, why um, uh, you know veterans and, and BIPOC communities should join this movement is that you know, everything you've heard today is, is focused on the individual people that's in those communities. We want to serve all, but we think it's time that we focus on our communities because they're the ones that's been suffering from a lot of the pandemics, a lot of the health disparities that we've talked about in this interview. And so there needs to be a call to action. And I think the, the team that we've assembled here at Indigenous Health, we have the expertise, the knowledge, and the trust to be um, imparted with this, this huge mission and can be accomplished um, if we have individuals join that movement that we're, we're creating. Uh, we do believe that you know this would make the whole world a better place and what we're trying to create, the ecosystem that we're trying to create. And so uh, our main goal is to have an inclusive environment and ecosystem that benefits all and uh, that's the number one reason why you know I would pledge for every uh, individual in the BIPOC community and my veterans that understand what a call to action means for us and, and, and how important this mission is to join us uh, in this mission. So to add to that, you know, um, you know, Yusuf is absolutely right. This is by us for all. And, and so for us, this initiative is about our families, it's about your families, it's about our communities, it's about your communities. Um, I think about my three daughters and the type of world um, I want to leave for them. And in that world, my hope is that they have personalized access to care, um, that they will not be another statistic when I think about the health disparity with maternal mortality. Um, and just so many issues that have gone on for way too long um, that have caused so many uh, lives in the black community to end so early, uh, to end in, in sickness and, and suffering. And so for me, this is very, very, very personal, deeply personal, and we, we cannot wait for any institution uh, to take the lead or to do what's right. Uh, I'm tired of waiting. Uh, we ultimately have to be that change that we hope to see. And the only way we can do that is each one of us joining this movement and, and supporting this effort, sharing uh, what is necessary so we can all benefit. And, and if we do that, uh, we can make a difference and we can improve our communities and the whole world.
people should join and potentially sign up to be research partners in this effort because one, it helps create the opportunity for personalized interventions designed for them. And this is new drugs, new therapies. The second reason is because ultimately, if we think about what it ultimately takes to create a new drug, it's a lot of effort and time on the side of research partners. And those research partners aren't getting the maximum benefit from their participation. So if you come to Indigenous Health and you join our movement and you sign up, we are promising, we are pledging, we are sharing uh, significant amounts of the upside with those who come to us and, and choose us as their preferred data steward around drug discovery. The third reason, ultimately, you know, people should come because they care about their communities. Every part of our mission is about serving our communities and other communities that have ultimately been underserved. And so part of the profits and part of the enterprise value that we're going to create over time is going to directly be put in those communities in the form of health services, in the form of treatments, in the form of you know just access to better health care and access to better social supports. Um, and so for us, it's about building out an ecosystem where the benefits to those who choose to partner with us go beyond the handouts people receive today for participating. Um, it's actually bigger than that. It's more comprehensive. And so that's the reason. Um, when we think about all the reasons people should come to us uh, to kind of you know, join the movement and, and participate in research. Um, what you'll see is, is better health care for all. I think that's our original goal, was to get more involvement and in inclusion um, of minorities and uh, women in clinical trials so that we could drive better drug discovery and efficacy in, in, in the products that's going to be produced. What you see is longer life um, for patients. Um, and then the other thing is what I think is most important. We may not be able to change some of these things in our lifetime, but as Michael mentioned, uh, building a better healthcare system for our kids. Um, and so if that you know, resonates with the individuals um, that are here now and their grandkids and, and granddaughters and grandson, that will benefit from this research and with them participating in research, we'll see a better world and a more healthier world in, in the communities, uh, BIPOC um, and veteran communities as, as we build this ecosystem um, using the genomic data and the clinical information in order to build better ecosystem for all.